I spent about a month now first learning about and then creating quantum dots myself. There are probably millions of them in this vial, and as you might be able to tell, they're actually pretty special. They absorb light of basically any color, like in this case blue, and then they emit a bright light of their own in return with highly specific colors. Quantum dots are tiny nanocrystals, only a few dozens of atoms wide, and not only are they some of our earliest proof that quantum physics is real, but they are also already used to create the brilliant colors of many high-end displays, including in the TVs of Samsung and Sony, and one day they're even expected to revolutionize everything from solar panels to camera sensors and more. The scientists who discovered quantum dots just won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their work last year, and I got to make my very own quantum dots in a lab in Berlin to help me understand how they work and what their future might look like. And spoiler alert, I think their future is pretty bright. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video, and also a special thank you to PlasmaCam for inviting us to their lab and for showing, explaining, and fact-checking everything with incredible patience. A link to both will be down in the description. These three vials contain the samples that I made with the help of chemists at PlasmaChem, and they are the exact same quantum dots, just in various levels of concentration. But at least as interesting are these additional four vials that I was allowed to take home, which contain just the dots themselves in a powder form. You'll see that there's an absolutely tiny amount in each vial, just a few little crumbs, but you can already kind of make out their colors even like this. Now, these specific quantum dots are hydrophilic, which means that we can add water to mix them up, which is exactly what I did. In goes our water, then I give the whole thing a little shake, and voila! Our quantum dot slurry is now done. After adding water to all four of my dials, they each turned into these beautifully colored liquids, and all of that just from a few little crumbs. And the most unintuitive thing is that despite looking very different, all four of these vials actually contain basically the exact same material, cadmium telluride. They all have the same molecules arranged in practically identical crystal structures as well, and yet they look nothing alike. At a much larger scale, cadmium telluride looks even less like its quantum dot versions, and instead it is a black crystal that certainly does not glow in any funny colors. So how can the same material have so many different colors? Well, for that, we have to talk about size. If you take any material, like say this piece of paper, and you divide it in two, you still have paper. You can keep dividing it, but of course you still just have paper at the end. The pieces have the same color, the same weight, the same electrical and magnetic properties, etc. Similarly, you can see that dividing cadmium telluride from a large crystal into smaller crystals or even into a powder of many, many tiny crystals doesn't fundamentally change properties like its color either. But that changes when the pieces become so small that quantum effects start to take over. You might remember from chemistry class that in a crystalline material, atoms are arranged in a recurring 3D patterns known as a crystal lattice. A lattice usually goes on and on, always repeating itself. Meanwhile, a quantum dot is just a tiny segment of that same structure, but it's only a few nanometers in diameter. For scale, the size of a quantum dot is to a football roughly what the football is to Earth. It is unimaginably tiny and only a few dozens of atoms wide. Now this is the scale where quantum effects start to take over, which is what you can see with your own eyes in the form of various colors. To understand how this works, imagine light, or in other words a photon, hitting our quantum dot. The energy of this photon excites an electron inside the quantum dot, making it jump to a higher energy level, and then after a while this electron will fall back into its former lower energy level, which in return releases energy in the form of a new photon. But quantum dots are so small that the electron is confined in this process. Think of this as the electron not being able to jump as much as it would like to. How strong this confinement is depends on its size, and that in turn impacts what energy levels the electron will return with, which in turn decides what wavelength, or in other words what color, the photon will have once it gets emitted. And this system creates a direct correlation between the quantum dot size and its emitted color. You can see in this prospectus from PlasmaCan that quantum dots that are physically smaller, like let's say 2.5 nanometers, have shorter wavelength, and then as the size goes up, you also get longer and longer wavelength on the light as well. And if you remember, short wavelengths equals blue and purple lights, while longer ones increasingly skew towards red, giving us basically the whole rainbow. The fun thing is that theoretically at least, you can make quantum dots from just about any semiconductor, and as long as you can get them to the right size, they will emit more or less the same color too. 
So that's the rough theory, but going to plasma cam and actually experiencing the whole process myself really made me understand how it works in a practice as well and how we could go from like drawings of atoms to actual applications like, for example, TVs. So in our case, instead of dividing a large crystal into smaller and smaller chunks, the process of making quantum dots actually worked out the other way around. We took the base ingredients and then tried to combine those into tiny new crystal structures that are exactly the right size. And we specifically made what is called mixed zinc cadmium selenide sulfide quantum dots. And this name right away tells you the four main elements that we will be combining into our final crystal structure. Two of those four, and specifically a source of cadmium and zinc, were measured out as salts and added to a flask. And to this, we added a liquid called octadecene. This is a so-called reaction medium, meaning that it is needed so the various materials can dissolve in this liquid so that they can react to each other easily later on. Next, we piped in some argon gas. This gas is constantly being pushed into the flask and because it is a heavy, inert gas, it actually fills up our flask, pushing out the air and moisture from it so that those cannot get into contact with our reaction in the flask and ruin it. We then added a thermometer to measure our temperatures. We started heating the flask from below and we got it all the way to almost 300 degrees Celsius. Once we reached this point, we prepared the two other ingredients, which are our source of selenium and sulfur. They came in a form of a clear liquid at this stage and so we used a syringe to add them. And you can see that as soon as they were added, the color changed almost instantly as our four main ingredients rapidly reacted to form the tiny nanocrystals that we were actually after. Technically speaking, at this stage, we already had our quantum dots, or at least the thing that we called the cores of our quantum dots. The concentration of them was so high that the liquid actually appeared almost black, but once we took a small sample of it and diluted it, the final color already became very clearly visible. So that's cool, but these cores then also needed a so-called shell. If you remember, we need the energy from that incoming photon to be confined inside the quantum dot, so we need to make sure that it can't escape before it emits the photon that we want. For this, we built another layer of semiconductors around the core that surround it. In our example, we did this by injecting dissolved sulfur from a syringe, which then reacted to some of the zinc from earlier to create so-called zinc sulfide shells around our cores. Now, beside this, the final thing that happened here is that we also added so-called ligands, which are needed to let the quantum dots interact with whatever medium that we want to use them in. For example, I've shown how some quantum dots are made to become soluble in water, while others might be formed to become quantum dot films, etc. I won't cover ligands in detail in this video, but for the most part, our quantum dots are now complete. So it's now time to separate them out from everything else that is floating around in this slurry, which includes pouring all of it into acetone first and letting the quantum dots precipitate or basically sink to the bottom. This allows us to pour off the remaining liquids, then we can centrifuge the remainder, we can pour off the liquids again, etc. And in the end, we have just the quantum dots. How cool is that? We've grown nanocrystals to precisely the right size, down to a few atoms, and we've done all of that in a lab in just a few hours. If you're wondering, the exact size of the crystals that is formed is determined by, for example, the temperature that the reaction happened at, or how long everything was kept at that temperature, and also the various ligands that were added, and so these variables will control what the final colors will be that we'll get. And talking of colors, we also actually tested exactly what the quantum dots that we made turned out to be like. For this, we used two spectroscopy machines, the first of which showed us what type of light our quantum dots actually absorb. And right away, you can see that they absorb a wide spectrum, from blue to green to yellow and even red. This chart says that any colored light will make the quantum dot glow, but the shorter the wavelength of the light, or basically the bluer it is, the stronger this absorption will be. This is why I am demoing my quantum dots with a blue flashlight, and this is also why quantum dot TVs like those from Samsung often use blue backlights behind the quantum dots too. And meanwhile, our second machine shows us what light our quantum dots actually emit, which, as you can see, is a very narrow range of about 605 nanometers. As a quick sanity check, 605 nanometers is right on the edge of orange and maybe red, which makes sense because that's what our quantum dots look like. Now, these emissions still come in a range because, of course, every batch will have some defects and because some of our crystals will be ever so slightly smaller or larger than the others. Narrowing this gap is one of the main goals of manufacturing, but either way, we got an extremely good result already. Absorbing almost any light and converting that into a highly specific color is one of the benefits of quantum dots, but the other one is that this conversion is then also extremely efficient. Instead of a color filter that will just block out all the light, except for the one that it is supposed to let through, 
through, thereby losing most of the brightness, quantum dots typically convert anywhere between 50 to sometimes over 90% of the light into the desired color. That is huge. And so this is what an application looks like in real life. In a QD OLED TV from Samsung, for example, the company uses tons of little blue OLEDs as their backlights for each individual subpixel. For the blue subpixels, the light just passes through, largely unhindered. And then for the other two, they add the red and green quantum dots to create the RGB matrix that is needed to show any color with very high efficiency. So that's how quantum dots work today. They're called photoluminescent quantum dots because incoming light, or basically photons, create their luminescence. But we also talked with Nanosys, who is one of the clear leaders in the field of quantum dots, and they seem pretty convinced that something called electroluminescent quantum dots will be the future. Without getting too deep into yet another chemistry lesson, you basically put the quantum dots between an anode and a cathode, and then you excite them via electrons instead of photons. There is no backlight, and instead the quantum dots themselves are directly made to light up due to the electron flow, which is why we call these electroluminescent. This lets us skip the whole backlight layer, it removes the problems around burn-in if you used OLED before, it should make manufacturing easier and cheaper, etc. Electroluminescent quantum dots are hailed as one of the clear next-generation display types that could take the crown from OLED, and they might even outcompete other promising technologies such as micro-LEDs, mostly due to being less of a pain to make. For now, the blue electroluminescent quantum dots have problems with short lifespans, just like the blue OLEDs did in the early days, but Nanosys told us that they expect them to be in real products in maybe 3-5 to five years. And if they are right, then I think the future of quantum dots will be pretty bright indeed. Okay, if you're as fascinated by quantum materials as I am, then you might have heard about some of the challenges that they'll bring to the industry in the future too. Like for example, quantum computers being able to pose real security threats by potentially breaking some of our existing encryption technologies. But guess who claims to be prepared even for a quantum-powered future? That is right, my sponsor NordVPN, who claims that their 256-bit encryption algorithms are safe even against quantum attacks. Now, I'm not a computer scientist, so I'll just take that to mean that they're very secure indeed. What I can vouch for as a mere mortal is that Nord is also the fastest VPN around according to independent speed tests. It is so fast that I can stream shows and play games and more without any noticeable lag. Look, you're a techie, so you already know what the VPN is for. Watching shows from abroad, unblocking geo-blocked websites, making sure that your traffic isn't compromised on dodgy public networks, getting the best prices regardless of where you're shopping from, etc. I use my VPN to watch BBC News and Bloomberg US, both of which are geo-blocked outside of the UK and the US respectively. Pretty often I find Netflix shows that are country locked which I can get around. And Tristan, who also works with Australian investor sites, often finds that those are geo-blocked too unless you are in Australia, so he uses his VPN for that. Nord has over 6,000 servers in over 60 countries to choose from, so you always have one that is close to both you and where you want your traffic to be routed to for optimal efficiency. And the company has also open sourced big parts of their service so security conscious folks can check out if all of their traffic is being properly encrypted and secured. And with my link, which is nordvpn.com slash techaltar, which is also linked down in the description, you get a few extra months for free if you pick a two-year plan, and you also get a 30-day money-back guarantee if you don't like the service. There is basically no risk in giving it a try, so check it out at nordvpn.com slash techaltar, and I'll see you in the next video.